Hello, I'm Graham, and I hope everyone's having a great day. Welcome to today's video, which is a presentation on the pros and cons of using legacy lenses on the Canon EOS M50 camera. Now, the M50 is a beautiful camera for shooting stills and 4K video. Now, quite a lot of critics of the M50 criticise the crop factor that's been applied to the video, especially if you're shooting in 4K mode. But for some instances, if you're a wildlife photographer or videographer, that extra crop can be beneficial. So it depends whether you're a landscape uh, videographer and want that wide vista, or you're a wildlife videographer and want that extra reach that the extra crop factor gives you. Now I fall into the latter category, I want the extra reach that the crop factor gives me. Now, we're going to discuss the merits of using some of the old film camera lenses on the M50 for video. Now, it's different if you're going to be shooting stills where the high resolution requirements of the modern sensor may be beyond the realisation of the film camera lenses. If you're shooting 4K video, again, that resolution isn't quite as severe as you need for stills. And again, if you're shooting 1080p, you can get away with some uh, fairly low resolution lenses as that requirement for shooting video is very low. So we're going to be discussing lenses which I find are suitable for shooting 4K video. Now, the lens system I've chosen to use is the Pentax K mount. You can use any of the APS-C mounts, providing that the lens flange back distance can be accommodated by a suitable packing uh, adapter between the lens flange of the camera and your lens flange of your legacy lens. So the K mount only needed a 2mm thickness between the PK lens and the EF to ESM Canon adapter. Now you can get a one piece adapter that goes from Pentax K down to EOS M, but I just decided to use a ring as I didn't want the edit complexity of using additional uh, adapters. So this little ring between the lens itself and the EF to EOS M adapter is all that's required to give me the infinity focus of this lens. Now remember, we are talking using fully manual lenses, so focus is manual and the aperture control is manual. No way of controlling either of those from the camera as there's no system to communicate from the uh, processors in the camera to the lens itself. But that's not really a bad thing. It does teach you how to use a camera correctly in a manual stills or video production. Now, when I'm talking about video production, I'm talking about amateur me methods here. I'm not talking about fully professional methods where you're going to be using much more sophisticated lens setups than you're going to get with these simple manual lenses. One of the reasons I suggest that is if you're using these manual lenses, you may notice what's called focus breathing. So as you're changing focus position within a shot, you may see that the actual outside periphery of your frame is moving as well, and that's called breathing. So that could be disturbing if you're shooting in a professional mode, but for most amateurs, it wouldn't be noticed and is probably inconsequential. Now, with the legacy lenses, these were designed for a film-based system. And the film itself had a matte surface, so when the film was running in the back of the camera and light was shining through the lens onto that film during the exposure, there was very little reflection from that matte surface back to the final element of the lens itself. So reflections weren't really a consideration. But now with a modern digital camera, that sensor has got a highly polished surface. And lens reflection becomes an issue. Some of these older legacy lenses have got a plain or convex final element, so light coming through the lens, being reflected off the sensor, back to this plain surface, is reflected back down to the surface of the sensor. So you get either hot spots or a reduction in contrast. Not a lot you can do about that. You can just test your lens, and if it's fine, you've got a good winner there. If you've got these hot spots, there's not, unfortunately, much you can do to eliminate that problem. Some of the more recent um, analog lenses, if you want to call them that, have got a convex lens at the back and you don't get as much reflection. Now, another issue you may come across when you're using wide angle lenses is the fact that with these digital sensors, each of the pixels has its own light gathering lens and then sort of a light gathering tube which takes the light from that lens down to the center itself. So the angle of incidence of light rays needs to be fairly uh, tight to the lens axis. 
With these wider angle lenses, especially the film lenses that haven't been designed for digital systems, those rays are quite obtuse and you start to get a lot of more vignetting on the outside edges of your image. So if you're shooting with a wide angle lens and you see you've got vignetting, if you can't correct for that in Photoshop, then again, the lens probably isn't going to be used in a digital environment. I just mentioned the vignetting. With digital lenses, you can profile that into the JPEG processing system within the camera and you get automatic correction for vignetting and lens distortions. With using a manual system, obviously the camera doesn't know what lens have been attached, so you've got no correction for vignetting or barrel or pin cushion distortion, so you're going to have to correct that in post-processing. Might be a bit of a pain if you're shooting video, but obviously easier if you're shooting stills. With these lenses, most of them were designed for full frame systems, so you are going to be talking about a crop factor of 1.7 of the camera itself, plus the additional crop when you're shooting 4K. So something like this 50mm lens would be something like 85mm if I was shooting uh, stills, and something like 105 millimeters if I'm shooting video. Now that could be an advantage if you're shooting video, if you're using wildlife, or it could be a disadvantage if you're using it for uh, wider shots. Ideal for portraits if you're using it in stills mode, you've got that nice 85 millimeter f1.7 light gathering capabilities, so you get some nice low light shots, an equivalent of about f2.2, f2.4, something like that, in terms of equivalent depth of field from a 35 millimeter lens. So. 50mm f1.7 lens is an ideal portrait lens adapted on this camera. With the zoom lenses, the only way you can correct for the change in light as you zoom and you're losing aperture from f3.5 to f5.6 is in the semi-automatic mode that the camera will take and that will adjust either the shutter speed or the ISO to correct for the change in light. So bear that in mind if you're using these lenses um, in the fully manual mode where you set the ISO and the shutter speed to um, the amount of light coming through your lens at whatever aperture you've got. If you zoom with the lens, then you'll see a change of uh, exposure because the camera won't correct for that if you're shooting in that fully manual mode. If you have the camera set to the semi-automatic mode rather than the fully manual mode, then obviously the camera will correct for the change in exposure by either changing the shutter speed or changing the ISO to match that. Looking at this particular adapter, if I just dismount the lens, you can see we've got here on the back the three millimeter lens flange adapter, which makes the lens flange back distance from the lens to the sensor correct for this particular lens and it does give me infinity focus. You can use the in-body stabilization of the camera to correct for the fact that you've got no uh, lens stabilization so you've got the digital uh, stabilization and enhanced digital stabilization if you're prepared to put up with some of the rolling shutter effects if you're going to be hand holding the camera. If you've got it on a tripod uh, then the extra crop if you're using it for wildlife is again an advantage to you but if you're hand holding this you do suffer from um, the rolling shutter effect as the image moves around on the sensor. Now I found the quality of these PK lenses superb especially this 50mm it's really sharp even at f1.7 from centre to edge. Um, because of the extra crop of the full frame lens used on the APS-C sensor. So that gives you that advantage. So let's look at some practical examples that I shot today using these two lenses at Liverpool Castle, which is built as a replica ruin of the real Liverpool Castle, uh, built on the site of Liverpool Waterworks Reservoirs at uh, Rivington. So some close-ups and some wide angle uh, telephoto shots just to give you an idea of the quality of these lenses and whether they would be suitable for your application, uh, your stills or your video productions. Well we're here at the replica ruins of Liverpool Castle built by Liverpool Corporation some years ago and it's on the banks of the reservoir which actually feeds Liverpool itself. <laughs>
So we're here to test the quality of the Pentax lenses mounted on the Canon EOS M50 body. We're using the standard EF to EOS M adapter and then a PK to EOS adapter which screws onto the front of that particular adapter. At the moment we're using a 28mm setting, aperture is f3.5 and my shutter speed is about a 320th of a second. Now ideally I should be using a shutter speed which is roughly twice the frame rate so I should be using about a 50th of a second but unfortunately I haven't got the right step up ring to adapt my variable ND filter down to 58mm so I can only use that on the Pentax 50mm lens that we'll be testing next. I'm roughly about three meters away from the camera so you can see the amount of crop we get using the adapted lens on the body. First of all we've got the 1.6 times crop of the full frame lens to consider and then we've got another 1.7 times crop when we're using 4K video so we've got quite a severe crop. Now in introduction I said that could be a disadvantage if you're shooting wide angle shots but if you're a wildlife shooter you're getting that extra focal length which is all important when you're shooting small birds and small animals. Okay, let's now test this at different apertures. At the moment we're at 3.5. Let's have a look at it at 5.6, f8 and f11, just to see the sharpness on this brick wall behind me. Well, I've now got the aperture set to f8, and now the aperture is f11. I'm going to go in now for a close-up shot. I can see a small uh, flower growing in that window there. So I'm going to try and get a close-up shot of that particular flower. Well, at the moment I'm using an aperture of f5.6 and my shutter speed is currently 1 50th of a second, which is twice the frame rate. So that is the suggested speed of the shutter to give you that cinematic look. But in the wind that's blowing and that flower is moving about, we might be seeing some motion blur. So I'm going to open up the lens to f3.5 so I can get a faster shutter speed, which should reduce some of that motion blur. So now that is with the aperture f3.5, the shutter speed has gone up to 1 100th of a second. But you can probably notice a little bit of um, blooming around that flower itself. So the lens is uh, giving a little bit of reflection back, um, which is causing that little bit of blooming, which we didn't see at a smaller aperture of f5.6. The lens is currently set to 80 millimeters, which has given us something like 115, uh, 120 millimeters effective focal length before we apply the 1.7 times factor of the 4K video. So I'm shooting it at about 18 inches away from the flower itself. So I'm using um, F4 and I'm moving a little bit closer. Again, I used a little bit of exposure compensation here of minus one because of the darkness of the background. Uh, causing the flint to overexpose and again the exposure is using aperture f8 and the shutter speed was about a 50th of a second so the ISO in this shot is ISO 320 shutter speed a 30th of a second and the aperture is f8 so this is a shot of Rivington Moorland um, you can see Rivington Pike on the left hand side which is uh, one of the beacons used to warn of the approach of the Spanish Armada I believe and behind that is the Winter Hill television transmitter and because of the brightness of the sky I've got plus two thirds of an EV dialed in. So that's it for this video, I hope you found that useful. If you are a new viewer, please do click the subscribe button and the bell notification icon and you'll be then notified when I upload new videos to any of this series. Also check out my photographic blog and I'm going to put a link to that in the video description below. On that uh, video blog you'll find lots more information on camera systems, the Micro Four Third system, APS-C systems, the Canon ESM and Panasonic Lumich bridge cameras. Also check out the invitation there to join the monthly no, 321. Also on the home page is the application form there to join my newsletter group and that's a newsletter that's published every three weeks. It's more than news, it's almost a technical publication in its own right on camera systems and anything photographic that takes my fancy as I work through that three week period. So that's it for the video, I hope you do find that useful. As usual, thanks again for watching, please do take care and I hope to see you all in the next one. Goodbye for now.